Good morning. Um, welcome to day... 29. Four of the Conclave? Um, when we designed the Conclave program, um, we designed the first part of the week as sort of leadership support stuff, so it's been a lot of stuff about uh, different ways of understanding the interaction between psychology and spirituality and um, how to take care of yourself and stuff like that. Uh, some stuff about suicide prevention yesterday and a whole bunch of that sort of um, nourishing and supporting the people that are, whose job is to care for the community. Uh, the weekend we sort of designed as a public thing to kind of hopefully draw some new people in. I don't know how effective that's going to be because I don't think, I don't think our marketing has quite been up to our program design, but still, <laughs> that was the aim with it. Friday today is a um, we designed as a hinge day, and the, the purpose of today was really to try and get as many people um, interested and involved in the AJC in Australia and New Zealand into a room as as we could manage feasibly, given everyone's constraints and budgets and everything, um, and to focus today on kind of what is the Joanite tradition in, in various different dimensions. Um, and there's not a single answer for that question, I don't think. Uh, there's a bunch of different answers for that question, but there's some sort of family resemblances between different aspects of what the Joanite tradition is and has been. Um, so the point of today is, is partly to give as many folks um, around here as possible a kind of a grounded sense of how that family resemblance really feels and hopefully the kind of expansive sense of the various different things it, it has and can mean. Because um, the way the Joanite tradition works, I feel, uh, is, is an unfamiliar style of religious tradition. Um, there's not an answer to the question, what are you? <laughs> or what do you believe? Or what do you do? Um, there's a range of things we do, and there's a range of things one can do, and there's an enormous range of things that we all think and believe. Um, and there's something kind of mysterious at the heart of it that holds the whole thing together. And I feel that that heart is best felt and understood rather than told and understood. So the purpose of all the talking today, really, is to describe the larger space of what it can mean to kind of... Um, Kind of, I guess, give some sort of intellectual reassurance of the amount of space that's available to us, as well as hopefully giving you a bit of a intuitive felt sense of the kind of the heart of it all. So let's see how successful we're going to be. We'll give it a try. <laughs> Welcome everyone. Um, we have a bigger day today, which is exciting. It's nice to see some of the papers around the room. Um, they taught me an email. I was always supposed to say, "Hello, my name is Father Tim Mansfield. I'm the rector of the parish of St. Uriels in Sydney." Because I'm talking to a camera uh, for people who are, who are going to be here later. So the session's going to be recorded. So um, we we you know we've been using the phrase "fix it in post" quite a lot. <laughs> Feel free to say whatever you want. Nothing you say that's going to be uh, that, that's private or confidential or, or whatever will go out on YouTube. Ultimately, um, we'll edit things down and make sure they're sensible. What I wanted to try to do this morning. Um, as, a, as a way to sort of set some context for today and the next couple of days, really, was to share uh, the work of a Catholic theologian called Mary Collow that I've been kind of entranced with for the last 12 months. Um, and the reason for this is, A, I think she's brilliant, and I think more people ought to kind of pay attention to, this, to the work that she's doing. Uh, B, um, <laughs> I think I'm taking it as a personal mission to induce a, introduce a new female theologian every time I speak at Conclave. <laughs> um, <laughs> so all the most interesting people I read seem to be female theologians, but anyway. Um, and thirdly, or C, <laughs> I think Dr. Colo pulls, um, sort of, sort of sifts a, a really rich strand out of the Gospel of John. Um, and out of the various source texts that, that inform the Joanite tradition, of which the Gospel of John is one, but not the only one, I think John's a really valuable text. I find it a very valuable text to focus on, because the more I can phrase who we are and what we do in terms of the fourth Gospel, the easier it is for me to talk to more people, because that's the text that most people have seen or heard or read. And it gives a great space to communicate with people from other um, Christian traditions, most Gnostic traditions, just about everybody who's any, you know, anybody that's got any interest in Christianity at all has read the fourth gospel. Um, and it's also a great touchstone for, for interfaith conversations because folks who come from a Sufi background are often familiar with the gospel of John. Lots of Hindus have read the gospel of John. Out of all the gospels, it's the one they're most likely to have read. It's the one everyone says, you really should read John. It's pretty cool. The thing with John is it is really cool, but it's also, the more you read John, 
John's like a very detailed conspiracy theory. <laughs> it's got layers and interconnections. It's connected. It, it's like, you know, you're walking along the beach. I used to walk along the beach with my mum and dad when I was a kid, and, and we'd run across those balls of fishing line, you know, that, that got tangled up and screwed into a ball somewhere out at sea and then washed up with the flotsam and jetsam. And dad and I had this thing where we'd get balls of fishing line and spend hours. This is, it's good to have hobbies when you're a kid. I didn't fish. I pulled apart fishing line and unknotted things. John's a lot like a big ball of fishing line. Um, also, it's good to use to catch fish. <laughs> he said cheaply. But anyway, um, it doesn't, it's not just densely interconnected within itself, though. The Gospel of John, because of the really rich theological territory in which it was written, and the really rich time in the Christian tradition in which it was formed, um, and we, you know, uh, modern scholarship has it being formed over a fairly long period in multiple stages. And those stages are really baked into the structure of the gospel in a very artful, very clever, very deep way, which interconnects the gospel with a whole range of things that were going on at the time. And there's all sorts of speculation about which things were going on at the time. The speculation about is it connected to, to Greek and Pythagorean and Platonic thought? Is it connected to... There's, I've read suggestions it's connected to Mahayana Buddhism because we know there were Mahayana Buddhists in Alexandria at around the time the Gospel was being written, so it's possible there was a conversation going on there. We don't know. Um, but it's definitely connected to the really rich theological environment of first century Judaism in Palestine and Alexandria and Ephesus and, and the various sort of voices in Judaism that were happening you know, around the temple and then amongst the Jews who had chosen not to return from the exile, who stayed in Babylon and lived in Alexandria or lived elsewhere in the Hellenistic world. So it's such a, it's this arcanum of a, of a text, you know, <laughs> and the more you dig, the more you find, and it's fascinating. Dr. Collow's work is really interesting to me because she takes an approach of looking at the symbols in the Gospel of John, and she has a very interesting definition of symbol, which comes from the particular school of theology she works in, and it provides a way to read the gospel and pull out layers of the text that aren't immediately evident to an initial read. And it lends a richness to the whole text that I think helps to pull out deeper meanings that continue to resonate over and over in time. The particular meanings that she pulls out, I think, for our particular church, speak really acutely. And so I want to share some of this stuff with you. I've said to a couple of people this week, Dr. Collo has a brain like a spiral staircase. As far as I can tell, she's a deeply brilliant woman. Um, she's a Catholic nun. She's a presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary's sister. She works in Melbourne, um, and she's got a, a PhD. She runs like tours in the Holy Land every year and takes people for a tour around the sort of major sites of the Old Testament and stuff. She's written two major books. The first was called God Dwells With Us, which looks at the symbol of the temple in the Gospel of John. And the second is called Dwelling in the Household of God, <coughs> which looks at the symbol of the household in the Gospel of John. Now, there's a lot of density in these two books. It's ext they're extremely complicated, and really, um, I've read them twice, and, and yes, I still don't have the whole thing in my head. And I'm not a scholar, so um, I don't have the... I can't convey to you the richness of what's in the books, and I have to do that lame thing of saying, just go read Mary Collo. She's really awesome. Um... What I can do is to try to pull out some of the themes from the book and some of the interconnections that I found really significant and to try to pass those along that as a kind of a... This is a teaser for... I'm an ad for Mary Collar, basically. I'm the brochure version. <laughs> um, I'm going to take a, uh, just a sip of water, so any questions? <laughs> What is the, do you know anything about the, the philosophical or theological tradition that she's coming out of, what her influences are? Is she... Well, she cites the people you'd expect her to cite. She cites a lot of Raymond Brown. Um, Francis Maloney, who's another Australian John Owen scholar. Um, her biggest influence in terms of the approach that she takes is Sandra Schneider's okay. um, and her, her use of symbol and then a bunch of other people um, in that symbol analysis tradition, but I, I don't know the names well enough to be able to... She quotes Sandra Schneider's a great deal, yeah. so that one stuck in my head, but um, in terms of other theologians, I don't know enough about the schools of... <laughs> the different schools of thought and theology to be able to recognise which names lie in which tradition or not, so read Mary Collin and let me know. <laughs> um, I mean, she very much... As well as taking the symbolic approach, she's very much in that... that uh, that tradition of sort of saying that the these the same tradition as Raymond Brown of saying 
these books are written by communities. They're the voice of a community speaking to us in the present day, and it's written within the, the living situation of that particular community at time. And what's encoded into the text of the Gospel is the, the particular dramas and concerns and interests of that particular community. They're speaking to us across time through this book and the richness of what's embedded in the book. And really, to understand what's being said in the Gospel, you've got to actually look at, well, what, what was that then? What sort of situation were they living in? What, when I read that word, what am I projecting onto it from my experience? But what were they intending, likely to be intending by that word from their experience? And so that's a lot of the sort of symbol analysis stuff that, that she gets into. So let me push on and kind of... So I'm going to talk, about, I'm going to talk very briefly about what, um, what Dr. Collow's tradition means when they talk about symbol with a capital S in the context of the book. We, I mean, we all know the word. <laughs> we all know what it means. Um, but they, they mean something quite specific by it, and I think the, the, there's some interest in what that specific meaning is. So secondly, I'm going to talk kind of briefly about uh, the use of the symbol of the temple in the Gospel of John, which you know, you know, you know from your own reading of, of the work is a theme that reoccurs. There's a lot of appearances in the temple. You know that's present in the, in the work. But if you're not looking at it at the symbolic level, then you don't necessarily see quite how deeply the symbolism of the temple is sewn into the work. And I'm only going to touch that. I'm not going to go very deeply into it. Um, the third step I want to take uh, is to look at the symbol of the household and how that weaves through the gospel um, and kind of what the richness of that term yields up when you look at the living situation of people at that time. Um, and then the fourth step, which I forgot to put in the outline when I wrote it this morning, <laughs> is the so what step. Okay, this is all great. This is all great stuff about the Gospel of John. That's awesome. This is fantastic. And I, you know, it's, uh, it's terrific theology. But what does this actually imply for the Church of John in the 21st century? Which I think has to be our core concern. Um, and I think it implies a bunch of interesting things. Some of the things I think it implies we're, we're doing in a really rich way. And some of the things provide maybe slight challenges. Things to kind of leave as open questions and carry a bit of, you know, as a, a curious tension <laughs> over the next few years and kind of see how it unfolds. Um, I'm fond of saying that we're conducting, in the AJC, we're conducting a grand experiment. We're asking, what is the Church of John? And I think we have to stay alive to the question, what is the Church of John? I think we, we're at our best when we stay alive to the question, and I think, I think things get closed down if we think we've answered it. I don't think we've answered it. So my aspiration for us over the next 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 years... <laughs> is to stay alive to the question, what is the Church of John in the 21st century and how are we continuing to bring it to life? How are we assisting in the divine self-revelation through the Church? Big goal, there you go. Nice, big one. Set the bar red high. <laughs> okay. So a symbol, in the sense that it's meant um, in this tradition, is something which connects divine to human reality. And that, that cuts to the kind of Pythagorean, really, notion of, of a symbol. So symbol in, in Greek um, is the, the throwing together of two parts. Um, and it often got used uh, to refer to that sort of simple code thing, where if you, had, if you were sending a messenger out, you know, you'd have uh, one person with one half. If you take a, a, a seal or something and break it into two pieces, one person will get one piece, one person will get the other. And then to prove that you were, that you were appropriately um, authorised, you brought the two pieces together and you could show that the piece you had matched the piece that the other person had. In, I read some stuff on, this doesn't, to connect this to kind of the, the sort of Greek history of the word, I, I read some stuff about Pythagorean thergy a, a while ago and the notion of a symbol as um, during a visionary experience dealing with one of the gods, receive a whole lot of associational material, you know, with animals and plants and colours and certain kinds of music, certain sorts of landscapes and so on. Um, and one of the ways in which Thurgy functions sort of as a, as a process is, is to get access to that divine communion again. It's part of it is to reconstruct those images and sensations that you received in a previous communion and that helps to re-establish the link with that particular divine power. Um, and what we now have is sort of tables of correspondences in, in the esoteric traditions. You could see as, well, <laughs> it seems to be the case that for several thousand people over a long period of time, bull always means, I don't know, 
Your Grace? Sun. Sun? Yeah, okay. So if I'm, if I'm talking to Apollo, ball's a good symbol. There we go. So if I visualize a ball, that's going to help me attain communion with Apollo. So symbol, like, we use it in a very sort of mainstream term. You know, we talk, we talk about symbols in computer science in lots of, lots of sorts of context. But um, symbol in that old sense meant something which connects human reality to divine reality. Uh, and so that's the, the sort of eros of it. The agape of it is, is it's a vehicle which stretches the human mind to transcend its limits. So a symbol is always inviting us to think beyond mundane reality, to think beyond the day-to-day, -day, to think beyond the obvious, to think beyond the, the literal. Because of that, because it's work, <laughs> because working with a symbol is work, symbols can be misunderstood. It's very easy for someone to treat a uh, symbol as though it's a literal truth. Now, if you're familiar with the Gospel of John, that happens over and over <laughs> and over again in the Gospel of John. So... So this is a, a quote at the bottom from Sandra Schneider. The task of the symbol is to make that which by nature is spiritual or transcendent and therefore sensibly unavailable in itself into subjectively available, so available to, to people between their subjectivities by giving it a body, a sensible form. In other words, <laughs> symbols function sacramentally. They're a connection between divine and human reality. Does that make enough going along with sense? I was going to add the conventional, well, conventional for us definition of a, of a sacrament is something in which one thing is seen and another is understood. Uh, so, you know, or to get more traditional, uh, uh, a visible, an outward and visible sign of, a, of an inward uh, uh, grace. Mm. So, you know. I think what, um, what appeals to me about the way they phrase it is, is it kind of adds to that traditional formulation, the kind of sense of being stretched. Yeah. The sense that that inward reality isn't necessarily immediately known, that it's a kind of a challenge to kind of step forward into a broader understanding of it, yeah. which I think is awesome. <laughs> Free us. <laughs> okay, so the obvious, um, the two things that, which are quite similar, but um, quite similar superficially, but I think it's interesting to understand how they're different is the distinction between a metaphor and a symbol. So in a metaphor, in, in classical rhetoric, a, a metaphor has two parts. It has the tenor and the vehicle. So in the phrase, I am the vine, the vehicle of the metaphor is the vine. That's the image you're holding in your head. And the tenor is explicitly stated, I. So I'm making an allegory between me and a vine. Everybody good? We're all cool? Right. So <laughs> when Christ is trying to be super clear, he often uses metaphor. He often introduces metaphors as ways to make a teaching point. When he's trying to be challenging, he uses a symbol. Destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. There's a vehicle, the temple, but the tenor isn't clear from the statement. What, what, do, you, what do you mean you're going to knock down the temple? He's going to knock down the temple. Quick, get a gang and stone him. He's going to knock down the temple. How is he going to do it? We don't have wrecking balls yet. Ah! <laughs> it's anachronistic. Ah! He's broken narrative conventions. Postmodern Gospel of John. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's that's the sort of rough sketch of what a symbol is, and you you often find in um, in the sort of the, there's a narrative structure that occurs in the Gospel of John a great deal where um, someone asks someone comes to Christ with a question, and he answers with this kind of weird gnomic kind of symbolic answer, and the person goes, huh? <laughs> and 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 apparently almost deliberately misunderstands. Um, and, and, and unlike sort of Matthew, where he might go, <laughs> idiots, <laughs> he goes, hmm, and just gets more obscure. And the person goes, I, I, I understand the words you're saying. <laughs> and sometimes the person comes to a clearer understanding, and sometimes they don't. And it's always instructive. But there's a, you always get the sense in those, those pieces where you're invited into that conversation. Because the person that's there isn't understanding. And the symbol, I always feel that in those passages, the symbol kind of pops out of the page, and it's like Christ is saying, you get it though, don't you? Yeah, come on. You're in, you're in here with me. I mean, it's a joke on this guy, right? But, but we're in the same conversation, surely. Um, and it's that sense of kind of, of the symbol kind of reaching out and stretching, which is one of the characteristics of John. It's an invitation in.